Well, good morning. I would say it's nice to see all of you, but I can't see you. You can only see me. One of the things that uh, my three-year-old finds it difficult to comprehend is that she can see me at home, but I'm not able to see her. The first time I came home, I've told some of you this, but the first time I came home, she asked me if I had seen her waving at me, and I informed her that I had not seen her waving at me, and she could not seem to understand why uh, she could not hear me. But uh, here we are, and she, I think, is beginning to understand because this is becoming normal throughout uh, the course of these weeks that she can see me, but I am not able to see her. But I'm glad that you're here. I know that many of you are with us. You can see I've actually got my mic on now, so hopefully I can be heard at this point. If you've got your Bible with you, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I don't know if you learned any of this stuff when you were a kid, but when I was in elementary school, one of the things that we had to learn was how to write a friendly letter. I don't know if you had to learn that, but we had to learn that there were five parts to a friendly letter. There was the heading, there was the greeting, there was the body, the closing, and the signature. Now, I don't know why they they didn't ever teach us to to write hostile letters. I assume that they understood that we already knew how to do that. But they did want us to learn how to write friendly letters, and not only to learn the parts of a friendly letter, but we actually had to practice writing these letters. And so they would start out, dear so-and-so, how are you? I am fine, et cetera, et cetera, yours truly. And then we would sign our names to them. Well, today we're going to look at the final chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 16. And if Paul was writing a friendly letter, and I believe that he is, this would be the closing and the signature. In spite of all the really hard things that the Apostle Paul has had to say to them, and if you've been with us for any length of time, then you know that Paul has written some very difficult things. He's come out and challenged the Corinthian believers in some pretty significant ways. But in spite of all the difficult things that he's had to say to them, and by extension, difficult things that the Word of God has had to say to us, we know this is really a friendly letter because Paul basically signs it at the end, love Paul. The very very last verse of chapter 16 talks about his love being with all of them in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to finish studying the book today. We'll have one more message in 1 Corinthians next week where we wrap up some lessons, and I may even share some things that uh, you've given me by way of feedback of things that stick out to you. In fact, you can email me if there are some particular lessons that stick out to you as we've done this over the course of a year and a half or so, um, and, we'll share, and I'll share some of those things with you next week. But this week... We want to finish chapter 16, and even though the Apostle Paul has continually called the Corinthian believers to come together, they've been divided over all sorts of things, even though he's continually issued a call for them to come together in unity, this call to come together is not uh, uh, an encouragement for them to be self-focused. In fact, we're going to see in this chapter that most of the closing instructions that he gives to them actually turn them outward to other Christians and churches and co-workers in the gospel who are are outside of their church. He wants them to see that there is a continuity with them, with believers that are doing ministry in all other places of the Roman Empire at the time. And so he closes this chapter chapter with four final challenges to the Corinthian church. Here's the first one. The first challenge for them is that they need to support gospel churches. Support gospel churches. We can see this in verses 1 to 4. Here's what the Word of God says. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter 
to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. We see here in these short verses that Paul speaks of a collection for the saints. And if you've got a Catholic background, then I just want to remind you that saints are not a special group of people who are particularly holy. Saints is simply a Bible word for Christians. All Christians, all people who have been given new hearts and had the Spirit dwelling within them, according to the Bible, are saints. And Paul speaks of a collection for the saints that they had apparently already discussed amongst themselves. Now, he's going to spend all of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, or most of those two chapters, discussing this collection again because it's going to become a point of contention with them. But we do have a little bit of a clue about the identity of the saints for whom this collection is being taken up for, because we know that this, is go- this gift is going, according to verse 3, to Jerusalem. And not only do we know that this is something that he wanted the Corinthian church to do, but based on verse 1, this is something that he wanted other churches throughout Asia Minor to do, because he mentions the churches in Galatia having a part of this collection. We also know, based on Romans chapter 15, that churches in Macedonia and Achaia were participating in this as well. And those verses in Romans chapter 15 give us a little bit more of a clue on what was going on at the church in Jerusalem because they say that the offering is for the aid of the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So basically what Paul is doing is organizing lots of churches in the areas of Asia Minor to take up a collection for aid to believers at the church in Jerusalem, the poor believers who at the church in Jerusalem. There are many believe that they were undergoing a particularly difficult persecution at this time. And so Paul wants all these other believers who have never met the Christians at Jerusalem, will never see their faces, he wants to, them to take up an offering to support them. And he even tells them in these verses how he wants them to do that. And he gives five principles here that the wording of which is not original with me, that, that help them understand how they are to do this. He says in the first place that they should give regularly. We can see that from verse 2, which says, on the first day of the week. The first day of the week was Sunday, obviously, the day that the early church apparently began to celebrate and worship together in celebration of what we just celebrated last week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In fact, it seems, based on Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, that those early saints began to call Sunday, the first day of the week when they worshiped, the Lord's Day because of that. And Paul tells them that they were to, to develop a regular pattern of setting money aside on the first day of the week. Not only should they give regularly, but secondly, they should give universally because he says, each of you are to be ready to give on the first day of the week. Paul wanted each of the Corinthians to have a part in contributing to the needs of the poor saints in Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting that he calls on all of them universally to participate rather than just reaching out to those who are wealthy among the Corinthian church. One thing that we know is that there was a pretty big distinction between those who had a a plenty of wealth in the Corinthian church and those who did not. This is going way back, and I don't expect you to remember this, but Corinth was a place where there was a lot of new money. There was a lot of shipping. It was a place where people who had been freed from indentured servitude could come to start over and build a fortune for themselves, and there were many people in Corinth who had done that. But as in other places in the Roman Empire, there were lots of people who were slaves, who were indentured servants. And we see wealthy people and people who are not wealthy at all becoming Christians and being joined together in the same church And we can see how much of a problem that becomes in integrating those two together in chapter 11. Because in chapter 11, Paul is talking to them about the divisions that appear when they observe the Lord's Supper together. When they observe the Lord's Supper together, those who were wealthy were coming together ahead of time and having the best of everything, 
while those, and they were not waiting on those who had nothing. And Paul actually said, when you do that, you humiliate those who have nothing. So we know that there was a pretty wide gap in the church between those who were wealthy and those who were not. And yet, Paul encourages all of them to contribute. He doesn't just single out those who have plenty. In the third place, he tells them that they should give systematically because he says, put something aside to store it up. And what he's basically telling them here is that they ought to plan to contribute. They needed to earmark some of whatever God had given them for the collection of these saints in Jerusalem. In the fourth place, he calls upon them to give proportionately. We know that, see that from the phrase, as he may prosper. Paul recognized that their giving ought to be proportionate to the manner in which God had financially blessed them. He recognizes there, as I've already said, that not all of them have the same financial resources to give from. But one point that he makes that is important is that wealth is not a requirement for generosity. We don't just have to, it's, it's not just those who have plenty that can give. He simply calls upon them to give as they are able. And there's something really interesting uh, in the fact that in the next book, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 8, he holds up the church of Macedonia as an example for them for the pattern of giving that they ought to follow. But the interesting thing about that is it it seems that the Macedonian church actually has far less than the Corinthian church. Let me read verses 2 and 3 of 2 Corinthians 8 for you. Speaking of the Macedonian church, he says, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. So do you do you see the interesting thing there? Even though the the Macedonians are described as have be, as living in extreme poverty, their gift was a wealth of generosity. Now, we can't compare the gift that they were gathering versus other churches, but it's very possible that because of their poverty, the gift that they were going to contribute to the needs was a smaller sum than what other churches were able to contribute. But because they were giving proportionately, because they were giving out of their extreme poverty, Paul talks about what they had done as a wealth of generosity and teaches the Corinthian church and us that poverty should not prevent generosity. Even those of us who have little have been given something by God to contribute. Well, finally, in the fifth place, the fifth principle for giving is that they should give freely. We can see that in the phrase, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Paul didn't want to strong arm the Corinthian believers when he came. He didn't want to have to pry the money out of their hands when he finally came for a visit. He wanted them to be like the Macedonian churches who, according to 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 4, were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. The Macedonian church was begging for the opportunity to contribute to meet the needs of these for believers. Now, these instructions are aimed specifically at the Corinthian church and giving them principles for, for supporting financially Christians in another part of the world. But there are things that we can learn as a church from these principles as well. One is that the Bible calls us to be generous with what we have, whether we have been given a little or a lot. Some of us have little to contribute, and that's fine. God understands that. God doesn't ask us to give from what we don't have. God asks us to give from what we do have.
And that enables all of us to be generous to one degree or another. And I thank God for the many people, whether you have much or whether you have little, I thank God for the many people in our church who faithfully, financially support God's work. But some of us have little to contribute, not because we have little to give. Some of us have little to contribute because we view generosity as a luxury rather than a responsibility. Generosity is something that I will do if I happen to have something left over after I have met all of my wants and needs. Some of us look at our budgets and conclude that we don't have room for generosity. And that's an accurate statement. But it's accurate only because we are living at the full extent of our means and oftentimes as Americans even beyond them. We have the nicest car we can buy. We live in the nicest house we can live in. We have extended ourselves to the absolute edges of our financial capabilities in our lifestyles, which in turn prevents us from being generous sometimes with the money that God has given us. These verses suggest that generosity ought to be, in some sense, a line item in our budget that we sometimes bring our lifestyle down so that we have, are able to contribute more as God has prospered us. And we should give freely. The poverty-stricken Macedonians, even though they don't have very much, are giving out of an abundance of joy, the Scripture tells us, begging earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They want to. It brings them joy. And how can being generous with what God has given us, how can it come from that place with us? Because I've got to confess to you, my heart wants my stuff. Generosity does not come naturally to me. My first instinct is not always to give. Oftentimes, my first instinct is to protect what I have. So how can we cultivate in ourselves this generous spirit? The Bible gives us a clue for that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. A a spirit of generosity has cultivated us when our eyes are focused on the riches of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for for, for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, may become rich. Jesus forsakes the riches and glory of heaven. He becomes poor for our sake, so that we, because of his generosity, might become rich. And as we think of that, as we daily meditate on that, the goodness to us in the gospel it, it releases our grip on our stuff so that we not only give, but we freely give. We find joy in giving to others. Well, Paul wanted the Corinthian church to come together, but he also wanted them to be outward focused and supporting gospel churches like the church in Jerusalem. And I think the Bible would want the same for us. There's a second challenge that he gives us, not only support to support gospel churches, but in the second place, to send gospel ministers. To send gospel ministers. We can see this in verses 5 to 11. Let's read them. Paul goes on to say, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me 
for I am expecting him with the brothers. In these verses, Paul shares some of his travel plans with them. He shares some of Timothy's uh, uh, travel plans with them, a young man in the ministry that he had been mentoring. And he wanted to encourage the Corinthian believers to send those gospel ministers on their way. Paul and others like him were the tip of the spear in spreading the gospel when it came to bringing the gospel to various cities throughout the Roman Empire. But Paul wanted the Corinthian church to recognize that they had a vital role in contributing to that ministry. They may not be traveling like Paul and others in the missionary endeavor from city to city, sharing the gospel and planting churches, but they had a part in that ministry as they sent those gospel ministers. There was a wide door of effective ministry open to them. Jesus had said that the fields were white into harvest. Paul also recognized that there were many adversaries. There are many things opposing the gospel ministry. And we too as a church want to send gospel ministers. We support people like the Halversons who are taking the gospel to some of the farthest reaches in Africa. We want to support the reaching of unreached people groups who have never before heard the gospel even once in Brazil. We want to send people. There are people in our congregation right now who are wrestling with the fact of whether they want to go, whether God is calling them to leave their jobs behind, to leave these lives behind, and go take the gospel to other places, and that's the kind of church we want to be. I thank God that we are able to support and send gospel ministers to other places in the world, but we should not be satisfied. We want to see that portion of our budget growing more and more as we engage in gospel efforts to take it to people who have not heard. We may not be the tip of the spear, the majority of us, but all of us have a part in the global spread of the gospel and sending of gospel ministers. There's a third challenge that the Apostle Paul gives them in verses 13 and 14, and it's this, to stand in the gospel message, to stand in the gospel message. Look with me at verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Paul gives a warning to these believers, a closing warning that they need to be watchful, that they need to stand firm in the gospel. He's just told them at the beginning of chapter 4. 15, he's just reminded them of the gospel which he had preached to them and in which they stood. But if the Galatian believers are any example to us, if you've read the opening chapter of Galatians, Paul marvels that that it could be possible for a church to turn away so quickly from the core of the gospel to another gospel. There are threats to the gospel all the time. There are threats to our moving away from the centrality of the gospel in our church to getting sidetracked on the centrality of other things. And Paul warns them to stand firm in the faith. He calls men and women in the church to man up and be watchful, to be strong, to not be moved away from the hope of the gospel, but to do that in a loving way, to have that that firmness and that watchfulness uh, be controlled by love, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So we've seen three of the four final challenges. He calls on them to support gospel churches, celebrate gospel ministers, stand in the gospel message, and fourthly, he calls them to celebrate gospel laborers. Celebrate gospel laborers. We can see this in verses 12 and then 15 to 24. Let's read those. Verse 12 says, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Now look at verse 15. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, 
and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints, be subject to these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. There are several co-laborers in the gospel that Paul encourages them to give recognition to or to celebrate, according to verse 18. The first one is Apollos. Apollos would not be coming to them right at the moment. He would be coming later. But the Corinthians were going to have a fresh opportunity to have a healthy relationship with Apollos. If you remember from the first four chapters, the Corinthian church had been divided over their favorite teacher. Some had said, I am of Paul. Others have said, I am of Peter. And still more have said, I am of Apollos. They were polarizing around their favorite. And Paul had called them not to do that. Apollos would return. He told them to welcome and celebrate Apollos' ministry among them. He called on them to recognize the house of Stephanus. And if you remember from the first chapter, Paul was trying to remember who all he had baptized in Corinth. And he said, I'm glad because it seemed like some people who had been baptized were him, had loyalties to him as against Apollos or against Peter. And Paul had been saying, I'm glad I hadn't baptized most of you. But he did recall several that he had baptized who were probably some of the first converts. And the household of Stephanus was one of them, some of the first people that Paul had baptized. And so he called them to recognize them, and he thanked them for sending Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus to refresh him. And then he tells them that there are churches in Asia who are thinking of and praying for them who send their greetings. He talks about Aquila and Prisca, who is the same couple as we know elsewhere in the New Testament as Aquila and Priscilla, send their greetings. They have a house meeting in their church, and they send their greetings. What Paul is wanting the Corinthian church to do, even though he's been calling them to come together and being unified, he wants them to recognize that that unity extends beyond their own local assembly. They are to be unified as a, as a local church, but that metaphor of the body of Christ that he talked about, where we have hands and feet all contributing, that metaphor extends beyond just the local assembly. It certainly has to do with the local assembly, but the body of Christ is bigger than just their church, and the body of Christ is bigger than just our church. There are faithful Christians serving the Lord in all corners of the globe, faithful expressions of the body of Christ, and God intends for us to feel a unity with them, a solidarity with them, a continuity with them, because we are all engaged in the same work. And Paul says he writes this closing greeting with his own hand, what he's telling us here is, is that he probably dictated this letter to someone else. This was the common practice in that day to, for someone to dictate a letter and for someone to write it down. And after that letter had been written, the person who had dictated the letter would read back through the letter, make sure that there, it was correct, it accurately represented what he or she had wanted to communicate and then they would write the closing, the signature in their own hand to show its authenticity. So Paul is likely now adding his own real signature in his own handwriting to this letter. Paul has had some hard things to say to them. And if we're honest, the scripture has said in the course of studying this book, the scriptures have spoken some hard truths to us. 
But at the end of the day, this is ultimately a love letter. The last part of this chapter in numerous places have highlighted the importance of love. Verse 14, we've already seen, calls on them to do everything in love. In verse 20, he encourages the believers to greet one another with a holy kiss, which we can contextualize in our culture to a holy handshake, and which we can contextually contextualize even further in our culture based on our current circumstances as a holy wave or elbow bump, depending on what you are comfortable with. The point is that there should be a mutual love, a genuine love that we have for each other. He tells them in verse 24 that his love is with all of them. And we're going to come back to this in just a moment, but he also makes a pretty interesting point in verse 22. He says, let all those who don't love the Lord be accursed. What does he mean by that? Well, Jesus was once asked what the greatest commandment was. If he could single it down out and, and narrow it down to just one thing. And the way Jesus answered that was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Our commanded responsibilities before God could be summarized in the commandment to love him with all of our being. And yet, Paul has told us in this letter that we are in our natural state unable to do that. We are unable because as the natural person, as, as, someone who, as people who are corrupted by the influence of, influences of sin, we are unable to love God as we should and that failure to love God is sin. There are certain things that you can love or not love in this world that are totally a matter of preference. But our chief responsibility as human beings created in God's image is to worship Him and love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We don't do that and because we have not loved God the way we ought, the Bible tells us that His wrath remains on us. But friends, one of the reasons the Bible calls the message of Jesus the gospel, one of the reasons the Bible calls the message of Jesus good news is because God chooses to love a world that does not love Him back. God did not send His Son to a world calling out for God. We love Him so much. Come and rescue us. He sends Jesus. The Bible says He came into His own, and His own did not receive Him. Yet God loves the world so much that He gives His only Son, and in giving His only Son, He gives His Son to be crucified on the cross for our sin. Jesus rose on the third day. And the Bible tells us that those of us who have corrupted love, who love all the wrong things and fail to love God as we ought, we can be forgiven of our corrupted love. We can have hearts that are made fresh and new and clean, and we can start having a real genuine love for God cultivating, cultivated in us. That happens when we repent of our sins, when we repent of our failure to love God as we ought, and we put our trust in Christ who died and rose so that we could be forgiven. If you have never done that, this morning could be that morning for you. But returning to Paul's letter of love to the Corinthian church, if you think about it, the Corinthians were a messed up bunch of Christians, weren't they? They're arguing about their favorite teachers, and they're dividing in their own church over who they like more. They are celebrating their tolerance 
or sexual immorality in their church that Paul says isn't even tolerated in their wider culture around them. The Corinthian believers are suing each other. The Corinthian believers are participating in idolatry by eating food that is offered to idols in idolatrous temples. Even the way they have the Lord's Supper is wrong. Paul says when they do it the way they were doing it, they're eating and drinking judgment upon themselves. They're being proud about their spiritual gifts because some had spiritual gifts that others didn't. And so they thought that put them in the special class of Christians. There were still others in the Corinthian church who were denying their own future bodily resurrection and thus doing harm to the gospel itself. The Corinthian church was a messed up church. And you would think that Paul would not have the optimism about that church that he has. In fact, if you read through all of his letters, it seems like the church where he addresses the most problems is the Corinthian church, out of all of them. So how could Paul have possibly written a letter like this? How could Paul possibly have had hope for a church that was this jacked up? If Paul was going to get together his resume and include as, as uh, uh, the people on your resume, what are they called? The people on your resume that recommend you? References. References. That's what I'm looking for. If he was going to include as references on his ministry resume churches that are success stories, do you think that he would have put the Corinthian church on that resume? Do you think that he would have a, the Corinthian church set a letter of recommendation to another area accrediting Paul's gospel ministry? If I was Paul, I might leave the Corinthian church off my resume. But that's exactly what Paul does. In the next book, 2 Corinthians, his next letter to them, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul says this of this church, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The reason the Apostle Paul was so filled with hope for the Corinthian church, as jacked up as it was, is because their hearts of stone had been changed by the Spirit of God to become hearts of flesh. Their cold hearts were now warm and alive. They were once spiritually dead. They were now spiritually alive. And with all of the problems that they faced, Paul had the assurance of the gospel that though they had borne the image of the man of dust, as we saw last week, they would one day bear the image of the man of heaven. They would one day be fully and completely conformed to the image of Jesus. That ought to give great encouragement to us. Because we'd like to think that our church certainly doesn't have as many problems as theirs did. But I suspect it does. The hope for all of us dysfunctional Christians is the hope of the gospel which is why we stand in it. God has taken our hearts of stone and he's given new life to them so that they are hearts of flesh. We have received an inward renewal by the Spirit of God so we are able to accept and receive the things of the Spirit of God. Where we once loved everything but God, we now have had hearts that are oriented to him so that we can grow in love for him and each other every day. The reason Paul was so optimistic about the Corinthian church was the gospel. 
And the reason we can be so optimistic about ours is the same gospel. We have been changed. We are being changed. And Corinthians gives us the hope that we will be changed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that the gospel gives us. That you have taken us from all different walks of life. You have given us new hearts. And that though we struggle with sin, we have the promise that one day the struggle of sin will be no more that we will be conformed to the image of Christ, that we will be given even new bodies that are fit for the new heavens and the new earth as we spend eternity with you. I pray that the gospel would give us hope for change. God, I pray for unity in our church. I pray that you would help us to love one another deeply from the heart that we would cultivate in each other a genuine love for each other. But I pray that you'd help us not to become self-focused. I pray that you'd help us to become outward-focused, recognizing that the same gospel that helps us grow calls us to go. I pray that we would care about the ministry of the Word, the mission of the gospel going to other places, that we would feel a solidarity and a continuity with the ministers of the gospel and believers all over the globe. But we say with Paul, come, Lord Jesus. As we suffer, as we sorrow, as we wait, please come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.